I'm Makoya from the British Blacklist, um, and I'm here with the following. So I'm gonna, my screen's probably different from yours. So Reese, I'll start with you, that's what I can see first. Hey, my name is Reese, and I attended the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, graduating in 2015. Elliot? Hi, I'm Elliot Barnes Worrell, and I was at Central School of Speech and Drama, 09 to 2012. Um, Shakara. Hi, I'm Shakara Wyatt. I also went to Central School of Speech and Drama and I graduated in 2015. Uh, Dipo? Like Dipo? Uh, uh, hi, I'm uh, Dipo Ola. I went to the Oxford School of Drama. I graduated in 2018. I went from 2015. Hi, I'm Shaniko Okwok and I graduated Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in 2018 and Aurora. Hi guys, I'm Aurora Burkhart and I graduated from RADA in 2018. So guys, thank you for joining me today. And, um, you know, I reached out to Shaniqua because I saw her um, social media commentary calling out Central School of Speech and Drama because of their systemic racism and poor practice and poor treatment of um, their non-white students. I don't know if this solely applies to black students or their non-white students at large. And in light of the current climate where we're reflecting and reacting to what's been going on in regard from police brutality murders to just an exposing or exposing of um, systemic racism across the, the world, to be honest, and the UK's kind of reluctance to admit that they're part of the problem. Um, I thought it'd be good to have a discussion just so you guys, this voice can be heard honestly and um, get things off your chest and then talk about how we're gonna, how you guys are thinking and how we can support you in thinking and moving and affecting change because these institutions are important. We know that when you get into this creative space and you wanna be an actor or creative, these are institutions and pillars of re um, respectable reputation. And it's like we, to go to these schools, uh, you know, Give, give you a good career boost as it's as it were so Shanika I'd like to start with you if you could just give a kind of breakdown of what happened um, from your perspective um, and why how this all came about um so in terms of the, what the movement in itself and with me yeah, just, yeah, just how it all started everything. How it came about just in a nutshell so, oh, okay I mean I was I got a, um, I've always sort of said I didn't enjoy my experience at Central never really talked too much about it but I always kind of had that opinion and most people who know me know that about me I uh, didn't get into detail and when they kind of put out their posts there's their, their post that said that they will stand and support students and staff um through this movement and it people had sent me that they sent me it and they said oh, you, you have you seen this and I, I looked at it and I went I couldn't believe it because from my experience although I hadn't said it out loud I knew that that support that they had shown publicly had never been offered to me. And I, so I was really outraged. And so I wrote my comment and not only that, I then took to social media and then I at first, you know, had started off saying, you need to take it down, you need to take it down. And, and I kind of made this long post about my experience. And then, then actually it started getting a bit worse because, you know, I started crying and I realized, oh, this has really affected me. And actually you actually need to do more than just take it down. And it's it, over time it's escalated. And I started connecting with Reese and, um, Shakira and, and, and more alumni and going, wait, we've all got the same experience. We need to actually push them into doing something. It's not enough anymore just to, you know, have this trauma and have this pain in our heart. And, and, and that's how it all kind of started. So it was just me going, okay, everyone, can you repost and repost this, my story and get as many people to hear it so they know that this fake post doesn't really represent what's happening in the institution. And to anyone, I'm opening it to anyone, how, what was your um, reaction when you saw Shaniqua speak out? And how did it trigger you to either, you know, get the confidence to speak up for yourself? Or what did you do? What was your first reaction? That's to anyone. Um, I, I, I felt bad because I, I, I was one of the initial people that sent it to her because I saw it. And obviously knowing Shaniqua, I knew the treatment. So at first I felt bad because I knew how strongly she felt about this and like, it is such a slap in the face to see an institution that has, you know, historically treated a number of people so badly to then kind of virtue signal in the way that they have. So I knew that it was a very, very touchy thing to do. But I think from the response, it was the kind of like getting, making, making as many people aware that, you know, because we didn't force them to tweet this. They, they came out on their own accord and, and wanted to show that they were, you know, um, 
in solidarity with the black with the Black Lives Matter movement, but you know the history just shows that that's just not that's not the case. Dipo, um, Dipo Ola, what was your experience? Uh, at Doctor School of Drama, I, I would like to just say um, most of my experiences were with the, with the former principal. They have a new principal in charge, but from what I know, there's still issues um, going on right within the drama school as I'm in touch with people currently there. Um, my issues were um, a, la a complete lack of uh, support for any racial incidents that happened between um, myself and other people. Um, a huge kind of racial bias from the principal, I felt, and just completely a disregard of talent um, in terms of uh, attributing stuff like agent interest to just because we are black as opposed to whether we are talented. Um, I was called a slave and my, my principal told me that I'd get worse than that when I entered the industry. There was just a complete disregard and you felt like if this was the principal saying these kind of things, then you have nowhere to go. You have no support. You can't go to a teacher because you've gone to the highest power. So I felt like it was a complete, um, there was a complete lack of kind of any sort of structural um, safety for I felt people of colour. Mm. Um, so I guess maybe I'll go around the room and ask everyone actually. Uh, sorry, sorry. Reese, what was your experience? What was your reaction to hear it, seeing Shaniqua's um, cry? Um, yeah, so me and Shaniqua were talking back and forth on um, socials before Sensu actually made that post. And when they did, like, I was one of the people who forwarded it to her as well and was kind of like, are you seeing this? Because pe people were forwarding it to me. And I'd already commented on Instagram. And when I messaged Shaniqua, she was like, yeah, I commented on, on Twitter. Um, this isn't cool because their, their actions aren't exactly replicating, um, their words are rather, aren't exactly replicating their actions for so many years. And when that happened, I initially also commented and started sharing it with more people and asking people to comment and just share their experiences. And by the time Shaniqua um, shared her story on Instagram about her experiences, I think that connects to a lot of people because people were also feeling the same way that, that, that we all felt. And don't get me wrong, there are also positives, but there were a lot of negatives that happened that, that were kind of swept under the carpet. And for me personally, I didn't feel like Central stood with me in solidarity during my experiences when I was dealing with a lot of ignorant racial inst instances. And what kind of incidents, what kind of incidents um, did you with? It varies. A lot of it varies. Um, a particular thing would be <laughs> one of the tutors would not even refer me by the right name. Um, in my year group, there was another black man, um, really good friend of mine, and often they would call me by his name. And it took to a moment at the end of first year, a whole year, six days a week, 10 hour days, and we're studying a play called The Hypochondriac, and we're all chipping in with our thoughts in a circle. And I put my hand up and this teacher says, this, he calls me by this other person's name. And it got to a tipping point where I said, come on, man. Like it's been, it's nearly a year now. You know what? This other person, you you can respond to him because you clearly not you're not talking about me. But ultimately, like this made me feel like, am I even the right person in the right place? Because ultimately, it's like, you, you, it wasn't just this one teacher. It was multiple teachers who would not even get my name right, mm. and they'll be like, oh, you've got the same hair, or oh, you're the same height. But I'm like, there's loads of white students that have similarities that you guys don't get confused. So why is it only me? Am I here by mistake? Did you mean to give the place to another black student in the auditions, but you, did you mistake them for me? Mm. And I feel like that problem in itself stems a lot of negativity when you're in an institution where you need to be sort of nurtured in a safe space so you can grow and little things like that can um, spiral. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, Aurora. If you could just let me know how you felt seeing Shanika first and how it affected you and your experience as well. So, Shan and I are old time friends and we actually met getting into drama school and, um, you know, the, everything she posted, it's, it's nothing that we haven't spoken about. I think the difference was like, I think the bravery of just being really upfront and very public. Shan has spoken publicly about this before, but I guess with the current climate and I think like a feeling of systemic oppression being so obvious it, it it i think it's just heightened you know i think her experience was so raw and visceral and i think that was the the change that has kind of made everyone come forward and want to talk about it i mean for me talking about it like just listening to everyone makes me so emotional because like you know 
you go into this institution and you're getting this wonderful opportunity that you've earned from your talent you know you're one of a select few to get into an elite institution and you're getting this privilege of a, of a classical training but the first thing that happens is that you know that this training wasn't designed for you and you know there's there's a really it's great to get to gain an education but when you are made to feel like you are absent from the education you are supposed to be receiving is a very very painful experience and you know i went when i got to rada i just come from oxford where i've been through exactly the same thing i spent five years feeling very um invisible and you know i'm mixed race and the systemic pressures i face are, are very different but there was still so just such racism like being asked you know would you mind playing a black character it's just mm. you suddenly think like that you're just revealing to me what you think about so much of my identity and when you try and engage you know when i i engage in a lot of conversations with the, the teachers there and and i know that they have put in bias training and i know that they're attempting to make some changes but the institution's going through growing pains and at the same time the students are in pain so for all the time it takes to drag you know your heels through getting everyone up to speed with the people you're taking onto your course mm. those people are, are having to divert their attention from their actual training in order to educate you in order to heal themselves in order to fight battles which you shouldn't have to be fighting and i said it before and i'll say it again you go to drama school to become an actor and you end up becoming an activist you know i shouldn't have to sit down with with staff members and be talking about this and be told well these are the best you know white allies you're going to get it's going to be much worse out there we're not perfect but you're just thinking you the buck doesn't stop here just because you're having this conversation with me doesn't mean that it's going to be implemented doesn't mean that people are going to feel the changes you know it doesn't mean that you're you're making space for people like yes we did rather introduce beyond the canon and yes um you know there is a black um playwright archive that's being built up at the school but that's not accessible in classes if you're being told that that isn't important if you're being told that that doesn't matter these are things that you identify with and everyone else around you or well, not everyone but a lot of people around you are not having to fight hurdles and face difficult things when you go through historical research and you're talking about it in class and 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 everyone's able to shrug things off and you're like this is actually a very difficult thing for me to go through i'm trying to find myself in all of these different worlds that you're giving me and in order to do that i have to go through like layers of of complexities and difficult conversations that most of the time you don't want to have i hear you and i feel your pain i really do and shanika everyone in um talking right now i will go into it but yeah i'm just it's just annoying and upsetting to hear um elliot could you kind of give your reaction and how your experience is yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's deeply upsetting. I met, I know Shaniqua um, just through the industry. Um, I probably went the longest to go out of everybody here and um, was extremely vocal. I was the only black person in my class. Um, so I was the minority of one, which meant that the violences had no immediate consequences. Um, and yeah, man, I was vocal. I was the first person to do a black history assembly at Central and the fight that I had to do to be awarded that time. Um, and then the amount of people that didn't come from my class because they didn't think it was important. Um, I was just told every day, subtly and directly, that who I was didn't matter. Um, uh, but what I was was the important thing. So when, you know, it's, it's something that trickles down from our course leader telling me that was I not bonding with the class because of a cultural thing? Was it cultural? And this was before, this is week two of year one, you know, I'm 18. So I just believe him. Do you know what I mean? And it's only me. Um, I, I, I've talked about this on a podcast called Rule Not the Exception, which is a person of colour led podcast, not for profit. But um, to reiterate some of those things like, I was told that I was trying to, I was playing a pol politics student in a Chekhov play, you know, these dead white men that we're forced to study. And um, he knew about Nietzsche, right? This politics student, so like a dutiful student. I went and researched Nietzsche. And uh, then my teacher was like, I'm still not getting that you know who Nietzsche is, Elliot. Who is Nietzsche for you? Is it 50 Cent? So, and everyone in my class laughs. And when you have no black ally, 
around you, you are tricked into believing. I grew up in Peckham, do you know what I mean? A super diverse place. I'm also from mixed heritage. So uh, the only, you know, the only racism I experienced was from police. So I wasn't, I wasn't uh, used to institutional racism where I was part of the Institute. Um, so I'm just like, wow, maybe I was listening to 50 Cent on the way to school that day. Do you know what I mean? And then as soon as I learned what it was and started speaking out, I was blackballed. And I've, I've recently been informed that that legacy of, of negative behavior towards me from the white students and white uh, teachers, like after I had left, carried on. So if you asked a white student what their opinion of me was, they would say that I was a troublemaker or difficult. And if you asked a black student their opinion of me, they would say that I pioneered the conversation. Um, and that, you know, Shaniqua experienced that, Reese experienced that, that my name was held with this incredible controversy because I said, Black Lives Matter with my, with my chest. Um, and it just breaks my heart that I left in 2012 where the climate was completely different. And Shaniqua left a year and a half ago and experienced the same thing from the same teachers that trickles down into the behavior of the entire school, your students, the same targeting happened. Um, and she wasn't alone, but there were other black people in her class. And it's still, you know, it still happens. So I've spoken up about it. I've, I, I mentor like a lot of like young black students that go to drama school. I help diversify drama schools and talk to Central, talk to RADA, talk to lots of different drama schools about what they could do. And we're, we're still here. Thank you. And Shakara, for, um, if you could just contribute how you felt and your experience. Hi. Uh, so I originally saw the post on Instagram recent to me uh, and I immediately was intensely triggered because first of all it wasn't true so that was the first thing that came out of my mouth was the lies the lies and I'm in America so um, you know things are really Popping up with the with the uprisings here, we're really really fighting for our existence. Uh, so to see them say that they are standing with me now in this moment when they never have before made me really angry. Uh, and then I saw Shaniqua's post, uh, and I burst into tears because I think Shaniqua went you went to Central three years after me. So the fact that nothing has changed and if anything it's worse um was extremely heartbreaking because my time there i didn't face that much adversity due to race the entire time uh, i am mixed race i do have a certain set of privileges that um should always be acknowledged but um the racism was super insidious especially coming from the us where it's usually right in your face uh being in england i was like oh okay a little weird but it's not so bad and that kept happening over and over and over again where it'd be like oh that's a little a little funny maybe it's just classism and then by the end of it by the end of my three years with all of those things compounding all of the situations that had happened i realized just how vile and insidious the racism is in the uk how it's not acknowledged, how it's watered down, played down, um, and made, you were kind of gaslit the entire time to make, and made to think, oh, it's not a race issue, it's just a class issue, right? Like, you're from a low-income family, so that's what it is. And I'm like, really? That's, okay. Um, but one thing that I, I was posting about uh, when I was speaking out was, uh, a director that was making really perverse sexual comments about my body, my brownness. You know, he was like, your beautiful brown skin would look so good in a red bikini on stage right now. Like really weird shit like that. Uh, and I did talk to the tutors about this. Um, other students also had problems with him. Um, and what they did was they listened to me and then they failed me that term. Uh, and then they hired him back the next year. So, um, so there are. 
sorry no no continue continue sorry uh so yeah that was that was my second year i pretty much had a nervous breakdown that year for a multitude of reasons um i can't necessarily say it was triggered by that situation but lots of things were going on with me but i came back my third year and i basically just remember saying like you know, people kept asking me, like, you seem different. What's going on with you? And I was like, oh, I just remembered I'm American. Like, I'm not going to anglicize myself. Like, I'm not here for this shit. I am done. And I spent my whole third year just being like, no, Mm. absolutely not. I mean, (laughs) where to start? Because I'm I'm getting emotional hearing you guys experience because we shouldn't have to go into spaces that we revere. And hold to such high esteem and be treated like this. But um, starting with Shaniqua, Shaniqua, so I don't know why I did that, Shaniqua. <laughs> That's okay. um, uh, what, what was your expectation going into these institutions? Because we know that these institutions, we have, they have this kind of reputation of being very white, very posh, very well-to-do, upper class. So going into that space, even, you know, you possibly would have reservations, but did you have reservations? And what were your kind of expectations going into these into this institution? Well, um, to give a bit of background of me, um, I always, I grew up in an area in on Coulston where I I was one of o- the only black family there, and so I was I've always been comfortable in white spaces, being the only black person or the only person of color. And in my primary school, never experienced racism. Secondary school, I've been in I've been have had moments in boarding school. I've been in private education, like. I've had an experience of being in really white spaces, didn't experience racism. I went to the Brit school, that's the very liberal. In my, in my experience of that school, I can only talk on my experience, I hadn't received or experienced racism. And I think I was very vulnerable coming from Brit and then going into Central 18, thinking, I'm so, you know, I can do anything and, and be anyone. And that's something that Brit really give you, you can do anything, you get taught everything. So I really was empowered and going, I'm 18, I've got ahead and I'm open to the world. So it, it pains me because when I did my audition process at Central, the reason why I picked Central is because in the final round, they made me do my speech in a Jamaican accent and it just unlocked something so explosive in me. And I was like, this school is gonna really show me my identity and it's gonna show me my identity through the work. So I'm getting emotional because it's like, I had such high expectations. And I, I think what's happened afterwards is like, The betrayal and the hurt is why I'm like, I need to speak out because I didn't go, I didn't know about any of these voices. That's the kind of point. And I feel sorry for myself at 18 because I was so naive. I had such high expectations of this school and had worked so hard to to get my place and felt like I'd earned it just the same as everyone else. So to get there and in week three of first year, to be diminished in a way I've never experienced before has, and I haven't really spoken out like, I've never been in a room where white people have never defended me if something like that's happened. I went to the Brit school and they defended every person in every way, whether that's about your um, sexuality, your skin color, you know, they defended you. So I never experienced being in a room, not having as many people look like me to defend me, to also be betrayed and, and felt silenced by also my counterparts, as well as that teacher kind of overly, uh, overly analyzing a comment a student had made. A student had called my walk when we were, they were observing my walk and they had, he had said that he felt that my walk had made him think of a movie title, title called Chain Gang and the teacher, I thought the teacher was going to stop and say, you know, gosh, let's, um, you know, that's inappropriate, you know, Chain Gang, it's the slaves, you know, who walk with a chain and she didn't do that. She's tried to give him more reasons why I look like I'm walking like a chain gang because my hands were, you know, hold, my hands were too tight on my body, my feet were walking heavy and they were dragging and I felt so exposed and then for her to say you need to come to terms with the fact that you're going to play a slave hurts me because I was taught that I could be sorry I'm getting so emotional but it's okay I was taught that I could be whatever I wanted to be and I went to drama school to give me the opportunity to do that and to be told in week three that I have to come to terms that I will play a slave because that's in my trauma and that's inherited in me. 
diminished me for the rest of the training. And it was really hard to know I didn't have my peers who will ever speak up for me ever again, because in the face of racism, they didn't. And I knew that I would do that training now for three years on my own. And it was really hard. And um, in third year, I just, I third year, I was out. I mean, I was lucky to start working very early on. And it meant that I could really escape and go into the industry. But that pain, and I've never really actually cried about it properly because I was shut down very quickly. Because when I did go on social media, they responded back saying that, um, you know, if you speak out and speak out about things that happen inside the school, you need to remind yourself that you have signed a sort of like non-disclosure agreement that says you're not allowed to talk about the training outside of these walls. And I was, I was fearful at 18. I was fearful. I've never been in the front of this before. I didn't know how to deal with it. And in third year, I did try to do internal panels by writing emails, but nothing, nothing actually changed. And it horrified me when I saw everyone else's experiences. That's what's kind of driving me to go, I have to speak out because I realized, oh, it wasn't just me. You made me feel like it was, but it wasn't. You know what I mean? No, this is heavy. It's, um, it's a lot. Um... Yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, it's just a whole bunch of different instances that just compound together. Mm. Um, and something in isolation doesn't appear that bad, but everything together is what, it, 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 it's the foundations of the building that is the institution that is systemically ignorant towards our perspectives and our being, and it's ignorant to empowering us. Yeah. Um, for example, like Shaniqua's instance that she shared of us, um, to me, that's, that's enforcement. That's enforcing stereotypes and prejudices. Um, whereas I expected to go to an institution like that, like Central, to be empowered, to be made aware of such prejudices and stereotypes, but to learn how to be empowered by that, to overcome that, to be something more and greater, not to be enforced that that is what I have to change myself into being. Um, and I think, I think that's where a lot of the betrayal comes from. Um, to me, like, I feel like drama school in itself is like being forced into a boxing ring and, and being jabbed in the same place. And at the beginning, the jabs don't hurt that much, but then when you're getting jabs from classisms and racisms and sexisms and genderisms and sexualities, which can potentially be a thing, all these jabs compound and those jabs begin to to, to make a cut and we begin to bleed and we try to express our bleeding and we're being told nah you're not bleeding it's all in your head and we're like nah we are bleeding like can't you see the blood pouring out my face and where all the jabs keep hitting me yeah and we kept being told nah it's all in your head you're crazy you're the problem you're making yourself bleed we don't see color and i feel like that has been happening for years and that is what needs to stop and for me, it's, I'm very disappointed that it's taken a human being to be brutally murdered and suffocated across the world for, for this chain of events to actually transpire. Um, I'm very disappointed that it's taken something like that to happen. And I've been trying to wrap my head around what has, what has caused a, a, a massive unplugging of the matrix per se. Mm -hmm. And to me, Unfortunately, um, George Floyd's death is, to me, it's a metaphor. Um, I feel like him being suffocated with a knee in his neck for a sustained period of time, like eight, nine minutes, was it? Before, before drawing his last, last breath and dying. To me, that's, that's a horrific metaphor for how many people around the globe feel. Like we feel like society has just got its knee in our neck and is suffocating us and not letting us communicate that suffocation. It's denying us that it's suffocating us. And I feel like that is a possible reason as to why this has resonated so, so profoundly across so many people around the world. And to me, it wanted to make me actually speak up about what's happening in my own backyard, what's happening to the institutions that have helped shape me. And yeah, I mean, it's, I'm just disappointed that it's taken something like this for something, for these outcomes to, to have a momentum to it. This should have happened way sooner without this extremity, in my opinion. I think it's in, in response to that, um, just because we had a bit of the technical switch over, so we're coming back to the conversation, um, where I yeah. had asked Shaniqua 
the expectation you guys had of these type of institutions, knowing that these have, they have this reputation of being primarily white, predominantly white and upper class, how, what, how you kind of braced yourself to go into an institution like this. And as the fallout has come, you know, you guys have felt stifled, choked and isolated. I think in response, it takes something big for even to have the confidence to shift because you guys try to make your own, you try to raise your voices, but they were made to feel like you were the problem. You were the issue and it was your problem, no one else's. And that's how systemic racism works. It makes you believe that you're the problem. That's how we all exist as people of color and especially black folk, that we're the problem. We're always the problem. It's our issue, not white folks. And I feel like this change where we're having more white people actually willing to speak up and address it for themselves. This is where the Blackout Tuesday has been criticized for maybe not doing, for not having any sense or reason, but it actually showed this moment has shown in the brands and the institutions and the organizations who are paying lip service to this thing, it's left them open to challenge. And I think this is when the moment becomes right. So just as a hug, a virtual hug to you all, don't feel like, or if ever you feel like you wish you could have done more and you should have done more and it should have happened before on your own responsibility, it's not that. It's when the mood, when the universe decides it's time to, as you said, take the plug out of the matrix and reset the balance. Now is the time when you've got solidarity and people coming together. You needed some, unfortunately it took a black death as it usually does to kickstart this, but this is the time where you're not alone. And even as a sharing of these stories, as emotional and heartbreaking as it is, it's, there's empowerment in it, there's strength in it, in being able to be vocal at this time and how we take these institutions to task. So just for anyone else, what were your, ex again, just to expand it, I want some people, you guys to get a chance to say what you need to say. What were your expectations going to the institutions and how did you prepare, whether it was talking to others who were there before, how did you prepare for going into an institution? Because Shaniqua said that she was blinded by the fact that she'd gone to white schools that are, have white, high, white, high white population and are living in an environment with a high white population. So you do go in that sense of bravado and confidence. Like actually, I know these people, they can't do anything to me. But then when, especially it's worse when an institution tells you you are nothing. It's bad enough maybe kids being racist, but at least then maybe you can go to a teacher like that might protect you from that. But when no one's protecting you, how did you guys, did you guys have any reservations? Did you hear anything beforehand, but still thought, okay, I'm gonna persevere, persevere and see what happens. I'll leave it open to the floor. Um, um, sorry, yeah, jumping in. Yeah. Um, I guess you can never be prepared. Um, what what the, the difficult thing here is, is that as soon as I left drama school, because I wasn't prepared, of course, like, you know, I went to, I also went to Brit school, which tells you that your opinion matters. And it's the first time in a school environment that I've been asked my opinion on something instead of just like learning what's in the textbook, you know, and you assume that drama school is going to be more of the same. And I had, you know, asked some young black guys what their experience at drama school was. And they've been like, oh, it's a bit mad here, but you know, it's a bit mad. So I was like, okay, life is a bit mad. I'm from Peckham. Life's mad. Let's, do you know what I mean? Let's go. Uh, and you know, what I experienced was so horrific that when I left, I didn't want to discourage. The tough thing here is you don't want to discourage black people from going to drama school because it is discredited acting training that at the time I went, there was no parallels to. Do you know what I mean? And it means something on your CV. And it also means something when you when you step out onto the national theater stage and you can be heard right at the back because you trained, do you know what I mean? And like you get that five days a week for three years and everybody should be able to, to apply and go and get that training. And the difficult thing is, and I have encouraged more and more and more black people, people of color, white working class people, trans people, people from the queer community to apply to drama school, help them with their Shakespeare monologues, help them apply, you know, sat on the panels and spoken up for them to then invite them into the, do you know what I mean? The, 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 the chicken coop with the foxes in it. And that's what's really scary about that is my encouragement was to help and warning, like being, this is what it's like, this is what I experienced is that I don't want to scare them off of it. I don't want to be like, you, 
this is why I'm so conflicted with with the work that I've done and what's happening now is that you don't want to be like you can't go because you're gonna have a fucking awful time and it's gonna affect your mental health for the rest of your life that is I mean there's truth in that absolutely that's what happened to me I went to therapy afterwards I wish they had uh, subsidized it maybe I'm gonna ask for those reparations now but is is the, the the important thing and is that that they they still go but they're safe and that's the expectation that I want to hand out now to any black student going to drama school is that you will go this is what happens because we live in Britain and Britain colonized the globe and started slavery so this is what is going to happen but you are safe because there will be black people that you can speak to there'll be a support network for you there'll be tutors that your tutors have to be responsible to, that, that have to, they have to answer to, that your complaint will be heard, you will not be gaslit, you will not be told that you are wrong, you will have a support network that is bigger than the school, maybe an external body, like when you give your, when you give your deposit to a managing company, not directly to your landlord, that they have to answer to, that yes, bruv, it's gonna be hard, Yes, bruv, this is going to happen, but there's going to be black plays. You're not going to be the only one. There's going to be a system of counsellors for you to complain to. Your tutors will be held accountable for any and every time that they say anything to you. And that's the gift that I wanted to, to leave and give that I tried to implement. And what breaks my heart is all of that work that I tried to do from these testimonies from Reese and Shaniqua um, and everyone in this group, I'm just pinpointing you because I know you, it didn't happen it didn't happen so i'm gonna still back any black person to go to drama school with my heart and my chest and be like i'm gonna be here for you and here's my number but i can't assure their safety and that's the hardest thing um yeah you're blowing you guys are blowing my mind oh, Dip dipo do you want to say something yeah, um, just I, I I completely believe it. Ellie, everything you say is, is is so amazing, and like, I think the trickiest thing that I found, especially reflecting, was you go through everything, and then you 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 really think to yourself, like, was it a necessary part of my training? Like, did I have to go through everything they they went through? And then I just look at my 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 white counterparts, and I go, no, because that wasn't the case for them. You know, there was no, there was no. Um, light shone on what they look like as as it was on me and like and how they saw me as like a like this this big black guy this big black scary guy that would that would parole the kind of uh, the school grounds and i think i think the, like preparing to go to drama school i i feel like i got finessed to be honest because i remember going to my audition that just i felt like i felt special the way they they talked to me i felt so special and i felt like i was being seen and I was at a tricky time where, like, it was a huge risk for me to go to drama school. I was very alone. And, um, and, to, and I felt like being seen at that point, I, I, I could go back to my parents and go, look, I've gotten this place. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an actor. And then, you know, as, as, and then, like, on my first day, and obviously, I don't want to go back into this, but on my first day, like, one of these third-year students saw me in, in socks and, in, and sliders and assumed I was too poor to afford shoes. And so, like... You know, you just, you just completely, you, you just, you take, you have to take a look back and just think, you know, I'm, I'm here now. Like the only reason I didn't leave is because I, I, I said to myself, I'm going to do this for like, to prove to like my, my parents, my family that like, I'm not wasting anybody's time. I can do this. And yeah, the, the biggest struggle for me, like even now connecting with people who are experiencing horrible things now at the school is there's no like ruling body. There's no impartial middle people who are going to take on your views and say, that's out of order. This is out of order, you know, and and like that's the that's the, that's the thing that I've been struggling with because even now with all the support from you know the stage yourself, the British backlist, and like the Guardian got in touch and all the other people, all the other people, I still feel like I'm I'm in the, I'm doing the wrong thing. I still feel even hearing everybody's stories, I still feel like I'm doing the wrong thing. Sorry, um, I still feel like I'm doing the wrong thing. I still feel like I like I'm I'm at risk here. I still feel like I'm the problem and we're the issue for some reason. And I, I, I just don't know what, to, what, what the actual step is. I really don't know what the actual step is. Um, Reese, go ahead. Thank you, Depo. Mm, yeah, I mean, for me, like, organically, hearing what everyone's saying, like, it, moving forward, 
there needs to be an external independent body that can hold institutions accountable. It isn't an isolated instance of just one drama school, it's actually universal. And now that's out there and we know that, and that can no longer be denied, gaslit or isolated or swept under the carpet. Institutions have been communicating publicly saying that they have been actively doing things and internally trying to do things, but that's not been working. We all know that now. It can no longer be an internal investigation to fix these problems. It has to be an external investigation with, with people who, are, who care and are able to have an impact that can hold these institutions accountable. Um, and that conversation, I think, moving forward is what needs to begin to happen. Um, these institutions need to reach out to us and accept communicating with people like us to hear our opinions, hear our thoughts, and they need to really be humble in a way and sort of accept that an internal mechanism for logistically handling this process is not going to work. It hasn't been working for years. And if institutions can embrace that, personally, I'm happy to help. And I think a lot of people are passionate like myself and are willing to help. It's not a thing where we're against these institutions. It's a thing where we're expressing our experiences, where we're eloquently communicating that we have not been heard and this cannot continue to happen for current students and future students because it is not healthy. And I think it's within everyone's interest to, to communicate and for the institutions to accept that. Um, and hopefully that can happen, but you know, it's out of our hands, but we are saying that we are here. And I think that's an important thing. I think it's, it's very important. And it's interesting, Shakara, I'll come to you in a second. Um, it's interesting with all the outpouring, because again, with you guys being vocal and the press jumping on this, even myself, I'm not just, I'm not just separ separating myself from it. I reached out first as an auntie, like um, my young people. I've got a daughter who's 20, who's in uni. And through her college experience, she had some stuff. In her high school experience, she had some stuff because she went to a high, upper class high school. And this thing of fighting against a, th a system that makes you feel like you're wrong, it's a lot. And for young people to have to take that on without support, as I repeat myself, it's, it's horrible and you shouldn't have to endure it. And you should feel comfortable and have someone that you can go to and talk about your situation and have action. Because I feel, I think Shaniqua is saying that there are teachers that are still, I mean, from Elliot's time there to now, there are teachers, teachers still in position. They're not being reprimanded. They're not being fired if it's a fireable or stackable offence. Nothing's happening to them. So that's the part where, I mean, Shakara, like I said, I'll come to you, but in regards to you guys and your parents, in the time when you were going through stuff, who did you communicate with? Who did you talk to? And what was the advice you were getting? Or where did, because I was that parent that was down the school. I, you know, they hated me because I was like, no, you're not going to do this to my child. They really couldn't stand me. It had repercussions on my daughter because they kind of targeted her for having an aggressive parent. I didn't care. Like, you're going to not treat my child like she's a second rate citizen. But what did you guys do? And why did you, if you didn't speak to parents or speak to someone else, what was the support or why wasn't there a support for you at that moment? And Shakara, maybe answer that first and then say what you were going to say. Uh, we really just talked to each other, to be honest. Uh, I, I I got into Central at 17 years old, so, and I'm not from the UK, so I came there, just turned 18. I didn't know anyone, so when we were having issues, I talked to Reese and Jordan, who were the two only other Black people in my class. I was the only Black woman, so sometimes I would talk to uh, another student who was Indian, but that was pretty much it. I, there were no resources available. They did offer five therapy sessions with uh, a white therapist who was terrible, in my opinion. I went to one session with her and it was more traumatizing uh, than, yeah, it, it made things way worse. So there was no support. There was no one to speak to. Um, and what I was going to say before was to answer the question, uh, the question about expectations. My expectations for Central were above and beyond. Uh, I went to an art school, uh, which was primarily white. It was a um, semi-public art school, but you have to audition for it. And we had a well of support and very, very good training. Uh, when I got into Central, I chose to go to Central 
out of all the other English drama schools because at my central audition, it felt right. It felt like home. Uh, when I auditioned, I don't know about in the UK, but in the US, they make you sing a song. And I sang Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. And they asked, why did you choose such a, such a strong song? Or, or you know, with such strong subject matter. And I said, well, it's Black History Month and uh, I'm not really going to school right now. I'm not really showing up for Black History Month in any way because I'm doing auditions. So this is how I'm showing up for Black History Month while taking these auditions. And they were really interested and really interested and supportive of that. And they were like, wow, I think that's gonna be really great for Central. So I expected to go in to an institution that was going to support my existence, my history, and it didn't even, it, that did not happen. Like in July 2013, when Trayvon Martin's murderer was found not guilty, no one from the administration reached out to me as an American, as a Black student to say, hey, we've seen on your social media that you feel really strongly about this. We see that you are not good. No one, there was no solidarity then. It was just business as usual. Hope you're memor memorizing your lines. Um, and when things did happen at Central, uh, like when I, I mentioned this in one of my posts, uh, they asked students to do blackface, white students to do blackface because there weren't enough black students to play the slaves. We usually did colorblind casting. Uh, but the one time they had a play that actually had black students, we had to play the slaves. There weren't enough black students. When they asked us to do this, of course, we complained. Then they scratched the whole thing, but we were never given an apology. No consequences were ever taken. It was just like, oh, we're not going to do the blackface thing. Like, let's get on with it. As if that wasn't affecting us the entire time. So it's just, it's just really outrageous. And it's about time that we have an external committee and it's about time that we have counseling for these students, that we have mentorship for black and brown students, that, that we have folks that are in the industry that are black or people of color that, so that students can have folks that look like them that know what's gonna happen when they get out. Like, instead of just being told by your, your white tutors, like, it's gonna be like this, but worse when you when you get out of here, so you might as well toughen up. No, we need black and brown people to say, this is what your experience may be like. Here are some steps that you can take to ensure that you can protect yourself. We needed that, we did not get that at all. Um, Aurora, what did you want to jump in and say? There are a bunch of different um, different things, I'll just, kind of run through and then hopefully they'll they'll all come in um but I just one of the things I wanted to to say in terms of like going in going into the institution like I said I come from university and in my in my college there were 140 100,000 people in my year um and the black students were like me and one one friend so I already knew white spaces and I had kind of diminished myself in a way in order to navigate that and I, I went to RADA, it seemed like a much, like a place with more people like me. Um, so I thought it would be a bit more like that, but I just wanted to read you a section of an article that the head of the school gave in 2014, which I think will help contextualize what the experience of training there was like. He said, we, he's talking about Ben Wishaw and Gemma Arterton who come from working class backgrounds. He said, we've trained them to play middle-class characters that are favoured by directors. We train people to transform. Some of the actors that people think are middle class aren't. Ben's not middle class, nor is Gemma. The fact that they can do those roles is because we've trained them to do it. And, you know, in, in that regard, he's talking about working class actors, but I think like, if you go into RADA as a black student, you, I, my experience was that I was, I felt like I had to become white. Like, I had to, I had to talk um, white, and I had to act white and I had to be white as, uh, and that is through a very complex different parts of the training. And I remember really, really, really clearly, and it gets emotional just thinking about it. You know, you're trying to work on yourself. And in my second year, we were doing Shakespeare 
and I had a one-on-one -on -one with, with a movement teacher and she was like, you know, you, you feel like you have to deny who you are and you can't find your voice because you've not been using it. And it's so true and it's weird because she was saying that but and helping me through the training, but also some of the training was the reason that I was in that position. I mean, I know I'd come with that baggage, but you know, it was really hard and like teachers telling me like, oh, you don't have to tuck your pelvis for a louder bum because another one had been like, you're, you're not, you're, your back's not straight because your bum's sticking out. And it's like, that's actually like the physical anatomy of my body. And that happened to a lot of people. Um, so in that sense, it was, it was difficult because you you feel like that, that thing that Ed says in the article, you know, we train them to be like this. It's like that attitude still pervades and like, you know, we're going to train you because this is what you want. This is, you should aspire to be like this. This is the thing that you're aiming towards. Rather than there being, um, we, tr we train tr people to transform from themselves into multiple different people, some of whom are like them and some of whom aren't. Like some people get to play people like them the whole time because everything they have to concentrate on is like them. And other people are just, battling and battling and when Elliot you were talking sorry when you were talking as well I was trying to look for the article but I was listening but you know you mentioned the thing about Chekhov and when I was at uni I did a whole thing on Chekhov and I'm interested in how we do it in this like this in the drama school context because they're trying to make you go back to like that specific time period in time and you're finding yourself and I went in and did a talk and I said like no they're trying to teach you how to communicate with another person like disregard everything else and start from there and, you know, my acting teacher got me in to say that, but it was so controversial. You could feel that they were like, what? You're allowed to just like be from this. You don't have to just try and squeeze yourself into this model of this one thing. And it's like, that shouldn't be what it's about. It should be about you talking from yourself to another person and you build up from that point. And I feel for so many of the black students training, like you feel like you're having to just be someone else whilst trying to be yourself. And it's really difficult. And like, you know, I spent three years crying and holding other people crying across the years you know for their feeling of being erased constantly and being made to feel unseen and not once did I have to hold any of my white counterparts and them cry because they felt like their race was being denied was under attack was being ignored as being um, all these different things like that never once happens and and actually there were a lot of problems across the board you know and and i think Ruth, you mentioned the sexism and all sorts of stuff and the way that they were dealt with I, I, including racism by the school was just to kind of brush it under the carpet like we've acknowledged it so let's move on you know i remember one time working with the director and we were talking about race and I, one morning i woke up and i read an article about race and i sent it to the director and they said to me I was really annoyed because I felt like you should have been concentrating on the play I was like how can I not concentrate on my actual experience like I woke up and something that related to me, who I am I saw and and you're annoyed at me because I wasn't thinking about the play like I don't get to switch on and off my identity you know um so I think just I kind of felt like I knew what I was walking into, but whereas at university I've been able to put on a front, you're in an institution where they're asking you to take all of that away. But when you do, you get really hurt. And without the layers to protect yourself, it's just an ongoing thing. And it's, you know, I, I don't like talking about this too much because it is so painful and hearing everyone else's experience is just like, you know, it's, it's just, it feels unfair. And like RADA does have a, a wellbeing service and you do get counselling. I had counselling for three years I was there and then I continued for a year after because I needed it. Um, and the head of wellbeing at the school knows that, that all of the, the black students, the brown students, many of the women also need a lot of help with their mental health when they go through the training. And they do offer it. So I can't, you can't, you know, say that they, they don't offer it. But she was very concerned when I was leaving. Um, and was like, you know, help me. And I did help a bit, but I had to step back from myself to just say, like, I can't take on the responsibility to fix this. I spent three years doing it, and now actually I need to take some time for myself to process why I had to spend so much of my time concentrating on that and, and seeing the, the pain of my counterparts, what they're being put through. When we came here to, you know, do something that is a vocation, basically. Um, no, I understand. And I wanted to even just touch on, I don't think I addressed it earlier, saying that 
it's that it's that um, catch twenty two dilemma of wanting to be in these spaces when you know they don't really want you in these spaces. But why the hell shouldn't we be in these spaces? Because we have every bloody right to be in these spaces, and especially when these spaces are held in such high esteem and can benefit our careers in different ways and from any type of uni for any kind of profession the ones that relate to the industry that you want to get into the higher esteemed ones are the ones we want we should have a right to be in um because there is also the conversation about creating our own spaces doing you know having black schools black institutions and stuff like that but that takes money that takes growth that takes so much more than if there's an institution why can't it just serve us the way they serve it um dominant body of students. Why are people of colour, black students, treated so other or so othered? Um, I guess you guys have touched on things because I had a kind of order of questions, but I think you've touched on things. And it for me, it's like your experiences were horrendous. You tried to raise your voice above the pulpit and it wasn't necessarily heard. Now we have this new ground swelling of people responding, reacting and trying to make a movement. What do you want on the back of this? What you have, some of you have said it, but what do you want? Because I feel like, though it shouldn't be responsibility, there should be a presentation of, this is what we're asking for as alumni, former students, and for the protection of future students and existing students. What do you want? And how do you want that presented to these institutions who then have no excuse but to react to this demand? And I open up to everyone. Maybe Shaniqua, you can go first. I think, um, you know, if you follow my Instagram post as it's progressed, I think, the, you know, the first thing I said was take the post down. And then I realized, oh no, all these comments, if you take it down, you silence everyone. Then I was like, you know, you need to respond. I saw the response and I said, not good enough. Actually, you need to do, take mm -hmm. actions. And, and further than that, you know, everything that, everyone has been talking about there have been a group of us you know behind the scenes of me going you need to do you need to do actually going okay we've got pain pain actually can force change why don't we take on that responsibility but as a collective because now actually i understand your voice elliot i understand your voice reese i understand your voice stiffo i understand i understand all these different voices and i'm going to say right we're going to wear this as a united front we are going to be the people who stand up for the people experiencing that and and actually we're like we, we actually won't stop until there is change. And that if that means that Central or any of these drama schools need us to reinforce that in the right way and actually not give up because now we're a united body of voices, then we will do that. And I feel like um, we've, we've already started engaging in thinking about our own action plans on how we do this. And um, I think, I don't know if I wanna, I'll, I'll let someone else sort of talk about what that, that will be, but we, we're not just going to let the pain be the outcry and everyone goes, oh, I'm sorry about that. And then we move on. I think now we can see that there, there is a group and there's a herd. What used to be an isolated incident is now a pack of people. And now I'm saying, and I'm saying thousands, people even watching in. So not even the people there standing going, I felt something. It's people watching going, yeah, actually, you know what? Let me stand here because I didn't stand three years ago and I didn't stand five years ago and I didn't and I didn't. And like, you know what, it's time. It's time for, I'm going to say, I made a mistake and I'm going to stand with you. And, that, and those people are there. So I think it's now time for us to go, we actually won't stop until you actually serve. And, and I think Groove Elliot saying you need to make the training safe. I don't think people of colour shouldn't go to drama school. I think they should. I think they need to. I still use my training. But what they need is to know that this space will always be safe. And, that, and, I, and I do think it's important that we have that external space. And I know that plenty of the industry will back that external space that goes, we will hold all drama schools, so it's not just central, all drama schools responsible and creating that, that middleman. It has to be a middleman because internal has never worked. It doesn't work. And for the fact that not even just in our industry, all industries are saying, we, we stand up, you know, we, we, we agree that we've got a problem. So that means internal doesn't work across board. Internal doesn't work in the police system. Nothing works internally. It has to be external. It has to be external. And there has to always be a middleman because people don't feel safe necessarily going through the internal channels because if the person you're talking to isn't your colour, then how, how really can you really trust that they're going to betray someone who's not of their colour and really push that, really know why you're saying it if they can't even understand it. If they can't even see what you're saying, 
how can they push it forward? Do you know what I mean? There has to be a fair reflection of people in the room who are also reading what you're saying. It can't just be from one eye. It can't, it can't just be from one eye. Do you know mm. what I mean? Um, Dip, just to say we've got to wrap up soon, but um, Dippo, please speak and anyone else contribute to that. What you've, what, uh, what action you want. I think, um, I think clearly from like Shanika, a hundred percent complete everything you just said. Um, I also think clearly from the, from the top down with the teachers and even with the principals, there needs to be, they, they, they need to understand there can be no longer a gray area for anybody in those institutions, you know, and that includes the white students that have, you know, sat by as we have, as we have suffered and have now, you know, retrospectively offered, offered support and, and have approached us to educate them. All the teachers, they cannot, you are either complete, you either, you are with this new new kind of um, outlook or you have to go. You have to just get rid of all these people who have been complicit in, in, in all this suffering, all the pain that's been going on for so long. Um, and uh, my, other, my other point um, just uh, it fails me at the moment, but that's the biggest one. I think there needs to be uh, just like a whole change, a whole new, like you, we need, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't think in a minute because I'm, 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 I'm backed up, but mostly the, all the teachers that have, suffered, that have caused the suffering, if they're still there, they have to go. They have to go. I agree. Um, Reese, I'm continuing from what Deepo and Shaniqua have been talking about it. It's evident that it has to come from the top down. Um, as alumni, it's not our responsibility, but due to our experiences and our passion and our want for it to end, we have taken that responsibility. We have unionised, organised, galvanised, and soon we are now, in fact, vocalising what we want to happen. Um, a lot of schools have an, a sort of a, admitted to having systemic forms of racism, and they have sort of posted really kind of vague outlook plans and action plans. We need to be a part of that conversation. We went through the experiences. We know exactly what it's like and how deeply it has affected us. So we know best on an on a empathic level. We know best in regards to what things can be put into place. And so now the onus is on them to listen to us and to engage with us and to learn a new behavioral pattern that stops gaslighting and isolating and dismissing and denying and brushing under the carpet. Um, but really the onus is on them. We're here. We have a very strong opinion in regards to actions, specific actions that can be taken universally across the board, across drama school institutions. And the onus is on, is on them to humble and, and respond to that. Um, sorry, just to jump in. What's, what's tough about this is that we're doing all of this work for them for free. Um, so, we, we will be, you know, collating a list of demands that we're going to have signed and sent. Uh, but it has to be a top-down thing. I think every single drama school needs to publish a list of who's on their board. And if mm. their board isn't diverse, then they need to scrap the board and start again to reflect the industry that they're in. Um, and then they need to pay an external group of people. Currently, it's us doing it out of pain uh, to prevent it happening to anybody else. Pay black people to teach you how to reform your school. Mm -hmm. Pay them, listen to them. Because I know Talawa have been into drama schools and have suggested what to do. And I know that that work has not been implemented. So there needs to be a complete structural change, board down, that listens to the pressure groups that they pay to come and help them reform in order to make black lives and black trans lives and everybody, uh, people of colors lives uh, safe, their mental well-being safe in those institutions. Um, and yeah, man, go true. I uh, completely, completely agree. I just wanted to um, mention as well, um, Femi Ogans, who actually brought you to my attention, Shaniqua, and he's head of um, IAG, um, just because I just wanted to acknowledge there are black institutions and that you can go to if you don't want this pressure and you don't want to feel like this. But I also agree that we don't, we shouldn't run from these institutions. They need to be held accountable. Um, Shakara, are we going to say something? Um, yeah, I was just going to say something really, really quick. Um, obviously, it is not our job to be doing this work, and we are doing this work for free. But we're doing this emotional labor because it is so important. At drama school, 
you hear all the time. I'm trying to break you. I'm going to break you. I'm trying to break you. But right now, what we're trying to do is break and dismantle these racist ideologies that these schools are funded on, founded on. We are going to break that down. So happy to do this work. But like Elliot said, they need to start paying people. And yeah, I'm just going to leave it there. I think you're definitely right because there's this whole thing about getting black consultants in to talk for free and teach these people how to suck eggs and you should know, they should know. And also it's not just about young people who haven't had the psychological training. If this comes with other stuff, you, I'm even, I'm not equipped to deal with your outpouring. I'm just emotionally reacting to you guys because even in this space, I am concerned about you leaving, exposing yourself raw to this conversation and hoping that you, you, know, you, you come away from this conversation feeling some sort of enlightenment. You're not at risk, you're not at pain, and you're not sitting in your pain alone, do you understand? So it shouldn't be you guys on your own either. We need professional people, black people, who do this for a living as well, to support you guys, to have your backs, so at least when you're saying things and you're in these spaces and being faced with this um, pushback, that you have someone that can console you and, and keep your well-being at the forefront. Um, I just wanted to kind of try and, go on, sorry. Were you going to say something? Oh, just on, on that, I just would also like to, I, th I completely agree. And like, I know that at RADA, it falls on the buck falls on the black members of staff who act as like therapists, you know, when they're not and do eight jobs that aren't theirs and have stop and have time for everyone and kind of take in everyone's pain. And I agree that, you know, it can't continue like that. And I think a presser group is a great idea. Yeah, so what I wanted, thank you, what I wanted to say is, I wanted to kind of end it on a high note, not to undermine anything, but just maybe, what are you guys doing, what are you working on, and what can we, where can we see you, where can we support you, and definitely for this document or this pressure thing that you're going to put out, I know on the back of people watching this or hearing this, there's going to be a need to support and join, how do they do that, so it's a bit of a much thing, we've got to finish in about five minutes, go around the room, what have you got going on, how is your career manifesting? And then whoever is in charge of this list, can you give me that at the, maybe at the end of it? So I'll start with Aurora, I'll start with Shaniqua then actually, your hand's going up. <laughs> and okay, cool. I'll go to somebody else. Okay, Aurora, cause you're in my line of vision. Honestly, right now I have sweet buckle happening, but um, you know, I've turned to writing. I've been trying to write. I, I, just in, you, you have to write it right and I want to write a, a story about all the um, black and mixed race people who helped the abolition movement in the UK so that's what I'm focusing on and like a couple of other really random weird comedy things but um, yeah you know coronavirus hello it's real <laughs> Elliot um, I'm a filmmaker uh, so I'm writing a feature film with Film 4. I'm writing a TV series with NBC Universal. COVID has put those projects on pause, but they are very much going to happen. Just in reference to this, I would really love um, British Blacklist to shift the focus from anecdotal, and I know you already know this, sis, but from anecdotal to change, because I, I am conscious of everybody bearing their souls and, and the anecdotes being lost in the specific and it's actually the the broad. So it's a it's we're the we're in a representation of every black voice. So anecdotal isn't that important. It's 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 what we're saying needs to happen. Um, but yeah, man, I'm a filmmaker in it, and I've got some projects with some people that respect my blackness. I hear you, brother, um, Shakara. Hi. Uh, so. I work in production here in Los Angeles, and uh, right now I'm actually working on pre-production and a research project um, of a book that's written about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement by one of the co-founders. So what we're doing is we are uh, researching film and television over the last 40 years in relation to Black women in incarceration, whether they are at home holding it down for the family or incarcerated themselves in the movement. Um, we're kind of tracking how they've been represented in the media and then having these industry salons where we can discuss what what's missing, what stories aren't being told. Are we, have they been focusing on the trauma of the folks that are incarcerated? Are they talking about the joy and the love? Are they talking about the abuse? And we're essentially gonna be taking 
uh, all of our research and uh, putting that into the pre-production for a bigger, larger project in the media. Oh, thank you. Reese. Hey, yeah, um, at the moment, due to the situation, I also have nothing going on in that regard, but I am using this time to sort of hone my own craft and I've been writing as well, um, trying to sort of focus on how to tell my own stories. Um, before the lockdown, I was a part of a production in the West End and we were like halfway through our run and before we got shut down. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a very interesting time for everybody. Um, and I think as humanity, we can all use this time to reflect and begin to, when hopefully things get better and we begin reintegrating back into society, we can actually integrate into a better, into a better one. Um, and so, yeah, I'm using a lot of this time to reflect. Cool, I hear you, me too. Um, Dipo? Um, I actually have, I'm in the middle of, um, I have a show that's out on, on TV at the minute and, uh, it's been weird because obviously everything's been going on and Black Lives Matter. So I've like I've completely told them I'm I've, for this week alone I just stopped promoting the show because I just didn't feel right. It's been it's been so weird having like everybody speaking to me about the drama school stuff and then other people are like loves you in the show and it's just yes. like I don't really want to deal with that at the minute. But um, other than that, I have um, before coronavirus hit, I was supposed to like I was directing a play that I'd written with my friend and that's been pushed to October. So, well, whenever theatres open up again and uh, in the early stages of developing um, a feature film as well. So I'm just trying to keep myself busy as, as possible. What's the name of the show you're in that you don't want to promote? Oh, uh, We Hunt Together. Okay. What channel? Where can <laughs> we, we watch together. it? Um, it's, if you have Sky, Be To Your Virgin, it's on Alibi. If not, it's coming to Now TV in a few weeks, I think. And it's coming to America later on as well, but I can't say where. Okay, cool. And quickly, Shaniqua, sorry, I've got to go, but um, Shaniqua, what were you going to say? What are you doing and how can we get in touch with you and support you? Um, well, I mean, at the moment, present, nothing, obviously, COVID, but um, I've just seen that the Steve McQueen project that I worked on last year is going to Cannes, which is amazing, and that he's dedicated that anthology series to the Black Lives Matter movement. I think it's important to say that. I'm proud of that. And um, I'm doing everything in my life right now to show that I, I, I stand with that project, what I did politically with that project, that I stand by in my own life. And I will do everything around me right now in, my, in what I can see and what I'm hearing from people to implement that. And I will do that as my own internal investigation and show that externally to you know, the mass of the voices who've contacted me that I am working so hard within myself to show that in my own life that I really believe what my project represents and we, everyone on that project worked really hard on it to, to play for himself and to, to showcase, you know, their own experiences, their identity. And that's what, you know, the Stephen McQueen project represents identity, okay. a space and, you know, people, people will not be uh, erased. So, yeah. And where, where can everyone support you guys? Is it just following you on Instagram and getting to know more about the situation? What? Yeah, I mean, a lot of us are on socials, Instagram, yeah. Twitter. Um, we can maybe send you our handles if that is helpful. Yeah, that would be know. helpful if you just send me that and I'll put that out when this goes out. Shakari wanted to say one quick thing, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to say one quick thing about everyone working on things uh, during this time. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone that, you know, to really take time, if you can, to focus on black joy and the things that you're doing in life that make you happy, your art, your family. Uh, because at the end of the day, what we're fighting for is black joy and black life. And sometimes, unfortunately, black death is the thing that uh, leads us closer to that black joy and, and right to have it. So I just wanted to leave that. And I guess we'll end on saying, I mean, I appreciate you guys so much. Um, if I could hug you and squeeze you, and give you a big auntie hug, I would. Um, and hopefully in the real world, we'll catch, we'll cross paths and definitely keep your projects coming to me because I'll talk about them and celebrate them. And, uh, you know, it's very brave what you've done. Um, you shouldn't be put in a situation, you should never have to go through this, but it takes us, our voices, us to catalyze something, to be the catalyst into change. And that's what you are. It's an important moment in time and be proud that you're a part of it and protect yourselves, keep yourselves safe. 
And yeah, man, lots of love to you all and anyone who's watching this who has experienced anything, reach out to us. We're here for you. And let's just keep it moving, keep ourselves safe. And Black Lives well and truly do matter. Um, thank you, guys.